Okay, so thanks very much uh, for the invitation for this workshop and for uh, the opportunity to speak. I will talk about um, quantum IR effects in single field inflation. But let me start uh, with a disclaimer. So this is a very theoretical subject. It's really for inflationary aficionados. And in the last two years, I've been focusing on something else, uh, something called the fatty field theory of structure. Uh, so you might wonder, why do I care uh, what uh, I do? Uh, yes, I think you should, uh, as quantum gravityists, uh, be care. <laughs> because uh, cosmology is a way to test quantum gravity in the UV due to the closeness uh, of the Planck scale. Strass Planck, HCC, metric gravity is the weakest fort, uh, DC radiation, etc., are all things that we cannot see in cosmology. But with the end of the Planck mission, to be guaranteed to continue to gain information from cosmology about uh, quantum gravity, we need to understand the large structure of the universe, and they're not understood uh, right now well enough. So cosmology is going, passing from the CMB to large structure survey, and it's like going from leptonic collider to an hadronic collider. We did it a few years ago, but uh, in cosmology we don't understand QCD yet. So I think the fatty theory large structure we use as a field concept uh, is what I believe is the first consistent approach uh, to do the QCD for large structures. The results are, seem good, uh, but you have to sell it to the astro community, and uh, it's not easy to sell this kind of techniques to the astro community. So I've been trying to do that. Can you just clarify? Suppose I have a, a computer 10 times more powerful than the, the current one, the mo currently most powerful one. Is there any problem left in what you're talking about, large scale yeah, structure? Yeah, man, all problems are the same. Well, yes, we are completely, if what you say is true, in two years we will be fine but nobody's claiming we're going to be fine in two years. And um, yeah, it's, I can answer in many ways. For example, nobody's going to simulate baryon galaxies. That's out of the question. So it's sort of like the universe is turbulent and we have to look at the result of the turbulence to check the theory. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I don't know. Nobody can simulate the galaxy, the effect of, of galaxies on large distances. But also the dark matter, you can simulate in principle, but uh, it's not good enough. That is. Uh, it takes so long, and many orders of magnitude too long, that uh, right now people don't uh, analyze the data because uh, we don't have the theory to analyze the data. The data are taken, and we just don't analyze the data. So, in fact, uh, right now, if you look, uh, all cosmological information from inflation comes from the CMB. Large-scale structure survey are only relevant for dark energy. But I think we care more of inflation, so I think that's what. In particular, with this program, just uh, to advertise it, you can see that uh, the long distance universe appears, you can, the fatty theory for the long distance universe appears like a fluid with an energy speed of sound, about 10 to the minus 5 the speed of light. And uh, this is the, the measurement in simulation of the speed of, of speed of light from if induced emergent speed of light of dark matter, speed of sound of dark matter, uh, with two different lattice sizes. So this is the lattice running, and this curve is the theory. This I never show it. Uh, I think it's very nice, uh, but uh, for the, it's, very, it's a very particle physics thing. Uh, and in fact, it might remind uh, some of you, it might remind you something uh, similar, <laughs> given that here there is the father of this stuff. Uh, I wanted to show it. So, but let me, okay, let me just start now with the, the topics I was working most of the time until one year and a half ago, which is uh, uh, what, uh, understanding loop correction in inflation. So let's focus on single field inflation, and we wish to understand how the presence of fluctuations at a given scale affects the behavior of mode at a different scale. So we'll focus on the curvature perturbation zeta, which is, uh, you can think of it as delta t over t in the CMB. And there are several contributions that have been found in the literature. This has been found uh, logarithmic running, uh, out of the horizon time dependence, and uh, infrared logarithms where L is the, the scale of the universe, so the size of the universe. So I will present what I believe is a satisfactory understanding of these effects in single field inflation. And uh, I will present my point of view. Thanks, Steve uh, Giddens, for telling me that's fine. And I will try to take about 30 minutes. Uh, that was the target. OK, let us, let us uh, organize the discussion. So what we are trying to do is to understand uh, what is the fact? Imagine that in the, this is the, city, the inflationary epoch. Uh, there is a, a, a mode. This is space and this is time. A mode uh, goes on in, with time and stretches uh, out of the horizon and grows with the wavelength. And there are other modes around. There are long wavelength modes, we will call background. 
And also, as the mode uh, as becomes longer and longer than the horizon, short modes cap, keep popping out of the horizon. The process of inflation ends when the inflator reaches the reheating surface, which is this green line here, which is many, much wiggle because of the curvature perturbations that occur at all scales. So we wish to understand what the other mode does to, to this uh, zeta fluctuation. And there are two kinds of effects. There are what we consider, can consider dynamical effects. Dynamical effects are effects that are in principle observable during inflation. If you are an observer in the, uh, moving in the city space, you should be able to see this dynamical effect. For example, if uh, something, another mode changes the amplitude of the power spectrum of the mode at horizon crossing, or a bit before horizon crossing, you will see that. If uh, the, the curvature perturbation becomes time dependent when it's super horizon, the observer will think that it's in a different sitter epoch. So these are all dynamical effects. And then instead there are projection effects which are associated to changes in the scale at which a, mode, a given mode K appears is seen by a late time observer. If you wish, this is, this is really an effect that appears as far as I know only because we're dealing with gravity, where the modes itself, the fluctuating degrees of freedom, itself define the distances we're talking about. So this, this creates some subtleties. But just to emphasize, the projection effects can be physically observable effects. Right? Or are you saying? Yeah, but not, not by an observer during the sea, local observer during inflation. Okay. Yeah. But, but everything we observe is not local during inflation, right? I mean, everything we observe today is super horizon during inflation at the end fine. of the day. So, yeah. So, uh, you, yeah, yeah, fine. Do you disagree with this definition or not? No, I was just trying to understand. Yeah, yeah, we'll address this. So we'll address this. Okay, let's focus on these dynamical effects. In fact, uh, let's consider there are dynamical effects that can come either from short wavelengths than my mode or longer wavelengths than my mode. Let's focus on the short wavelengths of my, the mode that come out of the horizon after uh, our, the mode we consider uh, as cross the horizon. So it can be proved that uh, as uh, the mo our mode of interest crosses the horizon, the, the power spectrum, the amplitude goes to a constant. And I will prove this uh, maybe later. Therefore, uh, this means that the short modes uh, that come out of the horizon after do not have any dynamical effect uh, after horizon crossing, apart uh, from uh, the standard redefinition of the background history. That is, a one loop, uh, the short mode will uh, carry some stressed energy tensor. This will redefine a, a background history. So in fact, uh, this variable zeta, which is, uh, which is defined in the following way, Zeta, you can define zeta in single field inflation by setting delta phi to zero, this fixes tiny homomorphisms, <coughs> and this fixes special homomorphisms so that the matrix has the following form, where this is the zeta variable we're interested about, which uh, is conserved outside the horizon if you define your scale factor as the full quantum effective scale factor, that is after you take account uh, the quantum correction to the background. Now, proof of this is quite complex, as and it's very easy to prove wrongly there are results because everybody th thinks that this zeta uh, should be conserved out of the horizon because you can see that out of the horizon looks like just a redefinition of the scale factor. So that was something that we all expected. So I will do the proof in the second part. But uh, this, the fact that there is a, this, this, this effect from short mode is absent means that the dynamical effect from short mode to a long mode restrict themselves only when the mode is inside the horizon. And then we have the usual story of renormalization, divergences, counter terms. Uh, in particular, the only difference with respect to just story is that the logarithmic running that you get in the city space from UV divergences doesn't go like K over A times the renormalization scale, but as soon as the mode crosses the horizon, it becomes log of the Hubble scale over the renormalization scale, which is quite intuitive given that uh, this is, agrees with the intuition that uh, the city space has a sort of IR cutoff in the theory. But this just come out humbly from the calculation. You don't put it in and you get it. So the Hubble is the natural low energy scale associated to the normalization scale where the logarithms are small. Which H is that? H during inflation. H, uh, H, uh, is it H at horizon crossing? Yeah, H at horizon crossing. Cross. Yeah, cross. cross. Thanks. Thanks. H at horizon crossing at the moment. OK, now, so this is about short modes. Then uh, there are the other ones, which are the long modes. Now. Long modes, uh, when they cross the horizon, become constant. Of course, in space, because they're longer than the horizon, so gradients are irrelevant, but also in time. 
as we just, I just mentioned, that, that we can prove. Therefore, the metric for a long mode takes the following form, because any, the constraint variable n and i, the n parameters go to zero, and therefore uh, you just get a rescaling. You can see that the background mode appears simply as a rescaling of the coordinates. So all the effect of a background of a long mode, a background mode on the short distance physics, including our zeta, is encoded in the rescaling of the coordinate in this way. This implies that the correlation fraction in the presence of the background mode, zeta xi of the in presence of the background at a given distance delta x, is simply related to the vacuum one, the one up without the background at the same distance by the following rescaling of the coordinate. Are you thinking of this as a quantum coordinate change or a classical one at this point? Yes, it's um, semi-classical. That is, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, a quantum operator, but to be intended as, a, as expanded, and then we will take expectation values. So let me say, in the full quantum theory, you can tell or expand this, pull out with derivatives, and then take expectation value with the standard expectation values. In the universe, the situation is not so bad because modes, when they're the horizon, are, are very, very are incredibly semi-classical. Classical. So in the end, it doesn't matter that much. In fact, you can make uh, statements uh, for inflation in space-time that are true realization by realization, not just on average because uh, of the semi-classicality. But isn't the issue that we, we need to integrate over these long modes? Uh, uh, yeah, next slide, yeah. You mean for the divergences? Yeah. Yeah, one next slide, yeah. Sorry. So until that question was asked, I thought I understood this equation. But you're saying zeta sub b is a quantum operator? Yeah, is the is a field. Is the field, field. The quantum field. So what do I mean by the exponential of that? The yeah, I mean that uh, you mean that you tell her, I, I mean it uh, humbly that I tell her expanded uh, and I begin to take expectation value as many. Uh, right. I mean, in, well, I mean, is it, no, sorry, Second but even, term even more and simply. Third term and so on, all of them will have short distance singularities ever now. Yeah. Do you, are they subtracted out? Is there some prescription for defining the relative coefficients? <coughs> yes, they, they should be start. Uh, in some sense? Yes, so in, the, in this talk, the only part where I will focus on the UV, UV behavior is the former logarithm that I just mentioned. All this talk will be about the IR contribution. So to fix, the UV, there will be UV contributions, and um, they need to be renormalized. Uh, they can be renormalized, uh, as usual. For example, we, I've presumably want the user cutoff scale of the Hubble scale or something. Well, now, OK. So now I'm trying to, for simplicity, I'm trying to split. Exponential operators are not usually simply renormalized, right? They, each term requires its own renormalization. Yes, yes. You, you will do all of them. So the two, three, four, five uh, <coughs> functions, you, are, you have to renormalize all of them. Now, uh, as uh, uh, Steve was saying, here I'm talking about just long modes. Uh, to do that, uh, one, because uh, I'm focused on the long part uh, mode, if you try to evaluate this uh, in the full uh, quantum theory, you need to, to also propagate inside the horizon, where, where you begin to have divergences there. And they are a bit like... Uh, so the two point explicit renormalization of the two loop of the two point function has been done by me uh, and Zadariaga. Uh, yeah, should work also for the three four point function. So all, all that I'm trying to say is it seems to me this will introduce an infinite set of ambiguities in your formulas at higher orders. But, but I think the cutoff also has to respect this symmetry. I mean the cutoff yes. also needs to be shifted this way. Right? Yeah, it must be. There is a principle that. But there, it's a fair point because, well, I think that uh, we haven't seen, unless I've missed something, a careful definition of how to do all of this. Um, okay, we can, we can uh, I, I've done it. It, it is done, but uh, well, uh, yes. Okay. For the yeah, not in 30 minutes talk. Not in gen well, sorry, not in general, I don't think. The whole no, no, in general. Treating these as quantum operators and. So the, the, the two-point function of zeta uh, for the UV part has been, uh, I, I've done a calculation. I, mean, I didn't do the whole set of calculation possible. Just, just to point I out the situation that we really understand where things like this are difficult, if you go between the unitary gauge and some renormalizable gauge in the standard model, 
the unitary gauge Green's functions are not renormalizable. They, every order in perturbation theory, they require a new divergent counter term to be subtracted, blah, blah, blah. That's one of the reasons that people prefer to do calculations in renormalizable gauges where the usual renormalization program works. So anytime you have these non-polynomial functions in your, in your uh, changes of variables, you, you run into severe UV problems in ordinary yes. field theory. Yeah, sorry, I should have stressed, uh, it's true. Let me just stress that what, uh, let me explain the following. Here, I'm trying to discuss the IR effects, not the ultraviolet effects. So that's why you can put a cutoff with horizon sides and just decide. As we're going to see in the next slide, as one was trying to ask, we're going to have enabled this big logarithmic of the full universe dependence that I, and I will try to put it away. Um, yeah, so I'm focusing on this. If, yeah, that's, that's the, the, so for doing, See, what I'm going to show is that these IR divergences are going to cancel. Now, this is a, the explanation why they're going to cancel. It's connected to the special variance. One can just close his eyes, do the calculation without ever exponentiating the fields, and find that the IR divergences are going to cancel. Okay. So what, is do, what I'm doing here is uh, to, to explain uh, intuitively why the IR divergences are going to go away. You can just put a cutoff, close your eyes, and compute something that the observer will see, and they will go away. OK, thanks. Uh, well, yeah, sorry. I have a question. As time goes on, more and more modes become. Uh, yeah, this is the, OK, this is exactly one question. So I'll put the next slide. So, so that really, Z to B is really some time dependent thing, right? Yeah. OK, so, uh, sorry. OK, so in fact, uh, so in full space, uh, this, uh, this means that the, power, the dimensional power spectrum that uh, is just k cubed times the power spectrum. In the present background mode, it's just the rescale version of the vacuum one again. Notice that, as I said, that this is true for every realization. And also for every short mode, either inside or outside the horizon. This is true, just uh, as long as the, the, the mode of, of interest for us is, of the background mode is out of the horizon. <coughs> Notice that this, in principle, is a huge quantity, as uh, some of you were, were trying to imply, because this integral for a scaling, this is a, a coincident points uh, two point function, for example. And uh, as you integrate, you pick up all the modes from the beginning of the universe. So this is divergent as log of the size of the universe. And many people uh, put this into, into evidence. However, I think uh, we are interested uh, on the amplitude of the fluctuation at the time when they cross the horizon. At the time when they cross the horizon, this fluctuation, as I show, as I tell you, I will prove, uh, they freeze and their cost. So we don't need to follow them anymore for the amplitude evolution. So in the, in the, this means that in absence, absence of the background mode, at the time of the horizon crossing, the uh, two-point function is this, uh, the standard formula for inflation. The only subtlety is that it is to be evaluated at the time, we, which is called horizon crossing time, where the wind number over A is equal to Hubble. When you have a background mode, the formula for the amplitude of the power spectrum is exactly the same. That is, it's still h to the fourth for h to the plus square evaluated at horizon crossing. The only difference with respect to the absence of the ground mode is that the, what we mean by horizon crossing time is different in terms of the commoving wave number. It, it is this, just there is k, when k over the rescaled wave number is, over, is equal to h. So if uh, you can see that the amplitude depends, uh, when expressed in terms of the horizon crossing time, uh, only on the background FRW. If one identifies modes, not with the wind number, but with the time at which uh, they cross the horizon, then uh, there is, one doesn't look at this, uh, and there is absolutely no dependence on the long mode uh, in the amplitude of the power spectrum. I don't, I don't see how it's different from the first thing that you mentioned, this uh, huge quantity was everything. Because you're saying that locally you can do this, right? What I'm saying, locally, sorry? I mean, once you have a long background mode and it looks locally constant, then you can, you know, absorb it in the background. Mm -hmm. And that's basically also what is done in this previous approach, right? Except that when you then look at very big volumes where this long wavelength mode cannot be considered constant anymore, and you're looking at uh, different parts of the universe where there is, a, you know, where this mode really is changing, and you compare the two-point correlator in those big different, different parts of the universe, then there is a difference. I think that may refer to the last uh, 
line of your slide, right? Basically, can you see the last line? Oh, 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 <laughs> oh I don't know. Can I close it? So that's an important point. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, if okay. uh, the background mode re-enters the horizon later, okay, fine, okay. okay it can I'm affect things problem. later, yes, sure. but not uh, during the sit. Uh, and in particular, this means that the cato whatever matters will not be relevant L, will be the Hubble size now, which is not the size of the universe. Okay, I so. mean, everything is outside the horizon at the time of, of, of the Yes, but uh, I'm, what I'm, this uh, last line tells is that uh, there is a chance for modes up to the present Hubble to play a role. This uh, no, no, L totally is yes, going. Sure. Go. I'm just saying that even if you went to the reheating surface and looked at very different parts of the reheating surface, it would look, you know, it would be this. You can get things that grow with log of the number of e-folds if you look back at them. Yes. Yeah, I mean, okay, I think I'm not you, looking so at those. I didn't see you last time. Yes. It's very hard to look at those. No, no, it's fine. Sorry. Didn't so, sum no, no, it's okay. So, summary of, no, but, uh, so let me summarize the dynamical effects. Because I think, uh, so, the dynamical effects are the following. Shorter wavelength modes have no dynamical effects once the mode has crossed the horizon, as I'll show later. Longer wavelength modes have no dynamical effects while, while they also, also cross the horizon. So basically, there is no dynamical effect. All dynamical effect happens only when the modes are inside the horizon. It's, it's the usual story with a little, as in Minkowski, with a twist that instead of K over A, you get a Hubble at late time. So we really have to, to consider projection effects. But again, I guess, well, one thing to emphasize in the context of the last comment is uh, this is only if you're looking at things locally. If you're somehow looking at the wave function over a range of space that spans many horizon volumes, you know, there are physical effects in a sense. Yeah, but physical, yeah. Geometry yeah, yeah, this is a very difficult, yeah, and sorry, I should so say local. that. Yeah, yeah, right, this I should say. I'm focusing on something that is observable in the sense that it can be seen here. Yeah. Well, in gravity, this is, a, I think, a very subtle because uh, it's not enough to, I mean, one might think that something physical is something that is computed on a gauge fixed metric. This is not physical. I think physical is something that you look in your eyes. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I'm focusing on many, many Hubble volumes. When we look back, you know, yeah. we can see in principle, you know, this kind yes, of Yes, if one is able to make sense. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I see. Say it another way. Would your definition of physical even include the thing we are observing right now, the scalar power spectrum? Yeah. So, so would you? Yeah, that's. I see it in my eyes. So yes. Well, but we see it now. A local observer looking back then, wouldn't you have just ruled it out as a measurable? No, what do you mean? No, the power spectrum, that a certain wavelength is seeable now. Now, a person living at the time of the didn't see that wavelength. I see it only now. And in fact, this projection and vector that people is going to mention about, they come from when the, the long mode are going to enter inside the horizon, and it's what the normal astrophysics call lensing, uh, redshift per distortion. We, we, they have named these things, but. No, I mean, uh, well, I mean, so, sorry, uh, but I mean, I mean, there are effects that, Depends on, I mean, on, on, uh, on inflation. No? I mean, uh, I mean, I mean. So, say there is the the coupling between, a, I mean, a long mode which is inside the horizon and a short mode inside the horizon, right? Yes. Yes. And and uh, I mean, this long mode is generated during inflation, right? So, yes. in, in other words, if this is this if this mo long mode hadn't been generated during inflation, this daytime effect wouldn't be seen today, right? So okay. we are. It is an effect that is produced during inflation that we are seeing. That. I mean, so I don't see how you can say, I mean, everything we see wouldn't be there if it wasn't for inflation. So I don't see how you can say all oh, this is only daytime effects because in, in principle, all the structure we see in the universe is created during inflation, right? Okay, let me just do a very, very, a very, very, I mean, I don't think, uh, I think it, most of this is just semantic. Let me just say, yeah, if you find, do a calculation, find this, you would say that perturbation theory and your effect depend on this, perturbation theory is broken. You have to stop and don't know what to do. So. What I'm going to say is that this fat cancel, and I can continue to do the calculation. There is no problem. So the, I think it makes a big difference. There is okay. an IR product with, with yeah, but this is a Hubble, Hubble now. Yeah, yeah. sure. No, that yeah, I agree. Yeah. But that's yeah. uh, totally Hubble, different. The Hubble radius now. Yeah. yeah, it's totally different. Come on. I mean. Yeah. Well, so it's not a true infrared divergence, but it's a significant IR effect. Yeah, no problem with those. I no problem. I mean, what I'm, I'm going to define, I can define quantity and reheating, and then I can use the codes of the astrophysics people to evolve it. It's true that the mod will do, will have an amplitude, and will do lensing, will do redshift per distortion, will do a lot of things. They've been measured. It's not even a question. They've been measured. Yeah, but there is also part of that effect is also this geometric effect. Right? 
which you call yeah. it. Actually, once, once a mod is inside the horizon, is, inside the horizon is very difficult to distinguish between projection and dynamical effect because uh, they are both. They are both. Lensing is uh, the projection. I mean. OK. But the effect is still there. The, so let's talk about pro, so we have to talk about projection effects. The projection effect is the mapping from the horizon crossing time uh, of a certain mode to the scale at which appears on a, for a given observer. For example, there is lensing, gravitational redshift. Clearly, all modes inside the horizon now, when they re-enter inside the horizon, will have both dynamical and projection effects. This is very complicated. In fact, it's a job for astrophysicists who have actually already done this and detected it. For example, CMB lensing is a, a projection effect due to long wavelength mode on the short modes of the CMB. But here, we simply want to know the role of super horizon modes. I mean, I think this is the issue, OK? If, uh, I mean, there is this issue. So restrict uh, to calculate prop So I think uh, it's enough to restrict to calculate properties on the reheating surface. Because for the remaining time up to now, we can use just astrophysicist codes. And these modes inside the horizon will matter, but not the ones outside the current horizon. So in order to define the, for what the property of the fields on the reading surface, I need to relate co-moving coordinate to more physical measurable length, measures of length. And an example is to measure distances on the reading surface, not in terms of co-moving coordinate, but with the mass enclosed in the corresponding volume. So one can measure the fluctuations of the curvature uh, of the universe as a function not of naive distance, but uh, as distance taking the mass enclosed in a volume, uh, in a volume that contains that, uh, that region. In particular, since reheating is an isodensity surface, and reheating the temperature is 10 to the 9 GV everywhere on this surface, uh, um, this, uh, this amounts to measuring the curvature as a function of the enclosed reheating volume. OK, so if you, th this is a, a, a physical definition of distances. In fact, uh, for example, the number of stars uh, with 10 to the 14 solar masses, uh, halos, are, uh, is a direct, uh, directly a function of this quantity. So it just, it just makes you idea. The, curva, the, cur the size of the curvature fluctuation on a certain mass scale is what determines how many objects you form on that scale. So let's uh, measure distances with this quantity instead of co-moving coordinates. So how do we do that? Well, we, as I said, the amplitude of the power spectrum at the horizon crossing time is fixed. doesn't depend on the background mode. I need to identify to map the horizon crossing time into this uh, uh, volume of the reheating surface. Well, in horizon crossing volume, a Hubble volume is seen um, in the, at the time uh, of uh, horizon crossing in co-moving coordinates by this, this equation, just a cube e to the d3 zeta times the co-moving volume. This uh, volume uh, in co-moving coordinates at the end of inflation will cover a reheating volume, which is uh, the integral of the square root of the metric at the time of reheating over this volume. And I can divide by, by, by this quantity one. And I get, uh, if I divide by one, I can just put these factors in, uh, which are one. And you can see that this rating volume is this ratio here, which is just uh, the exponential of the number of foldings that you would have normally. A at the reheating over A at the horizon crossing times the initial volume times uh, this uh, uh, additional factor, which is the difference of the exponential of the curvature fluctuation A reheating which is very x-dependent. I didn't write x, but, x, but there is x-dependence, minus the curvature that you had at the time horizon crossing. So, so Leonardo, again, a question. So this you can only do, of course, once uh, you are zooming in on a region which is small enough that you can treat this long mode as a constant, right? So that you're able Which is because uh, I'm trying to identify the mode, uh, apart from all the, all the one effect. So you can do, only I'm, do it in a small region, right? So I'm map, This is a mapping from uh, um, distant to from a certain distance to when the, that distance crossed the horizon. Yeah, but I'm asking I don't need to talk about more modes. Down. And you, I mean, the, the, the equation one, right? You're assuming that theta is basically like a constant, otherwise your h will depend on x, mm -hmm. right? So you can only do this for regions small enough that you can treat theta as a constant. So once again, you're looking at regions which are large compared to this distance where you can treat theta as a constant in space then this, uh, this is close bridge down, right? So in other words, if you again compare 
things on large distances I'll, with the reheating surface, okay. you will see the effects, right? I, I disagree with this, actually, because, uh, I mean, I think discussions are welcome, so I just uh, reply. Yes. So I disagree with this, uh, because uh, uh, you can first consider this part to be slowly x-dependent. The x-dependent is suppressed by k long over a... I didn't talk about slowly x-dependent. I really talked oh. about distance. But this integral has... The wavelength of the long wavelength. This integral has a very, very short uh, su support compared to this. So all the dependence of the long mode is suppressed by k long over a h. So it's perturbatively small. You can take it account of it, but uh, it's, a, it's a not a higher divergent part any longer. Because uh, you have to hit it with a gradient. So the moment we hit it with the gradient, we're fine. No, no, I don't think so, right? I mean, uh, I mean, you have a long wavelength mode, which is sitting outside the horizon. I mean, are we talking about viewing inflation? Up? I mean, we're talking about the reheating surface, right? So then... Uh, yeah, so this integral is only on, on, a, on, a small, on, on a small fraction of the wavelength of, this, of the long mode. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying, right? So you're, you're a, restricting a small... yourself to a small region, right? So, this, uh, what I'm going to do next, that I think you already know, is uh, applies on every point of the long mode. Yeah, but, but the point is when you compare different points along the long mode, right? I, I don't do that. I mean, this is a... Ma you don't so choose for not doing it because you're asking it, you know, it's the qu and what I'm aiming at is this all depends on the question you're asking, right? So you're, if you're asking about whether you can locally get rid of the, of the effect of a long mode on the, on the reheating surface, yes, but I mean... But, so what I'm but saying, when, when we observe the sky, I mean, as you say, when most into the horizon, then we are looking at things which were all super horizon at the time of reheating, right? So we are looking at things which were very separated at the time of reheating. And as you also agree that, you know, when this long mode then enters the horizon today, then we will see a part of the sky which is bigger than the wavelength of this long wavelength mode on the, at the time of the, the horizon, right? It's true, but this, uh, this tells you that... Uh, I mean, I agree with that. That is, I agree that long mode inside the horizon now will, will contribute. Right. But here I'm giving a calculation which will include that terms. Will include that terms. But uh, it will manifestly include only terms that can matter now, which is up to Hubble now. It's just to make uh, the, the, the log L, uh, the log L term uh, manifestly irrelevant. But, uh, but uh, the Fed... I mean, if you're saying that this long mode is a mode that is inside the horizon today, then I guess we are interested in a region at the reheating surface which is larger than the size of this long mode. And then on that region at the reheating surface, which is the one we observe today, you cannot do this trick on all of that surface. You can only do it on part of that surface, right? Okay, I think um, I disagree. And uh, th this formula doesn't apply, goes through. So what you say means uh, that if in the past we had slow inflation, we couldn't do the computations. No. Even though only modes up to Hubble matter, still I cannot do the computation. This, uh, I don't think, no, and this formula that. tells you that. Not at all. I mean, I'm saying that if you use ordinary co-moving uh, variables, as every cosmologist does, then you, you get an effect which is, uh, you know, you get the linear effect, which is the ordinary one we observe, and then you get a small correction, which is uh, cut off by the longest mode we observe on the sky today. And we know that the perturbations on the longest scales we observe on the sky today is 10 to the minus 5. So we know that there is a small loop correction which is 10 to the minus 5, which is unobservable, of course, because we don't measure the power spectrum to a precision of 10 to the minus 5, at least yet. Oh, I mean, okay. As you, I mean, uh, okay. I mean, I just... Uh, so, um, I mean, so I if you do the calculation of moving coordinates, you have coordinates. intermediates log L. Yeah, if you go to the calculation of moving coordinates, you have determined the log L's. If uh, you do the calculation in moving coordinates, up to your eyes, these log L's will cancel, and you're, you're left with log Hubble now. Okay? I'm just doing the calculation in a way where log L never shows up. And so... You're focusing on a small... Yeah, sure. Yeah, but this, I can do the full calculation. That's it. I mean, um, so instead of doing the full calculation, I, I show you a, treat, a trick that uh, shows you immediately that you don't have to worry. That's, okay. that's all, I mean. As Linda didn't worry since, uh, I mean, Linda knew these things oh, in 81 immediately. You know, okay, but it's 10 to the minus 5, and you cannot observe it with this no. resolution. We have but this is infinite. Uh, okay, this becomes infinite. So in the 10 to the minus 5 times infinite is a big number. That's the problem. Okay, so I want to <laughs> immediately make manifest that the term doesn't matter. In Linda's book, he says there's this log, 
and inflation didn't last for too long, and so this log isn't too Oh, big, sorry. Okay, fine. Which is certainly the wrong thing to say, but that's what he said. I see. Uh, okay, so I was wrong. Okay, good. <laughs> Linde is wrong, okay? <laughs> and I will not get angry, but, again, but it's, okay. Just, it's okay. Just to try to close this out, so agreed... Usually he's always right, so that's why. I mean. Agreed we at least aren't now focusing on log L effects where L is infinity, but there are log L effects where L is Hubble today. Yeah, there will not be log L, by the way. There will be because uh, the fat inside the horizon are not scale invariant, so they actually they're still picked there. Okay, I mean, there is not, uh, but Hubble but now crazy. matters for things now, yes. Okay, so, okay, I think I said everything here. But however, let me focus on really something that I think is much more important. That is, uh, in this expression, modes shorter than the when number k contribute to the projection effect. That is, uh, this same formula that I took before over which, sorry, I, I think I never said this thing. So the, this uh, volume is given by this. Then notice that uh, in this uh, volume, which is the size uh, of a certain mode, uh, measured in this, in this way, is a change of coordinate. Long mode do not contribute because long mode are constant in time. And so they cancel. And so this integral goes only over modes which are shorter with respect to the, to, to the our mode. OK, so this is uh, crucial because that's the long modes manifestly don't play any role. But uh, short modes do. That is, uh, this integral is a support of short modes. And uh, if I tell expand this exponential, for the current universe, this is fine. Uh, these quantities are non-zero, and, and they are not that small. That is, uh, um, in particular, to leading order, since uh, linear level, this is, uh, we leverage to zero. These are modes much shorter than my mode. There is uh, an integral due to the square of these modes. And if you do this integral, you find that this integral goes like uh, the power spectrum of uh, the modes with 10 to minus 10 times the number of refoldings to the end of inflation, so it's 60, OK? So therefore, the, the reheating volume uh, um, covered by standard mode becomes this formula, which is uh, there is uh, the standard volume that uh, uh, in a classical expansion is taken by, by a mode, one, the double volume times the classical expansion. But there is a boost due to the short modes that came out of the horizon after the mode of interest crossed the horizon, and they contribute to the, to the expansion of the universe so that uh, there is a, the, the mode is projected on a longer scale, about uh, 10 to minus 10 times the number of refolding. So this is, a, this is a quantum enhancement of the overall expansion due to the short modes. That is, uh, if, you think, uh, if you look at the mode on the leading surface, and you ask when it crossed the horizon normally, classically it would be this. In reality, quantum mechanically, it closes a bit earlier by an amount which is announced by the number of refoldings to the end of inflation. This is a physical effect because the amplitude of the power spectrum depends on where, where we, when, when the mode crosses the horizon, as, just, as just, just, we just described at the, at the beginning. So this is, in principle, observable effect. Not that this, ter this term, for the more expert, is not to be confused with a time dependence on zeta. But just as a projection effect, it is uh, the question of on which scale a mode that crosses the horizon during inflation is projected uh, in our eyes. And it's similar to the other projection effect that we have uh, already in cosmology. Like, for example, the, we don't know what is the reheating temperature of the universe, so we don't know how long the universe expanded from reheating to now. This is a, is a, bit, is a physical effect uh, which uh, is a theoretical systematics of our prediction, because uh, we don't know exactly how many foldings were to the end of inflation, so this is the uncertainty we have on the tilt. This is a similar effect. As a mode, which is not uncertain, is computable. The mode crossed the horizon a bit uh, in a different position than naive data tree level. Leonardo, are you saying that there are such effects that contribute to the power spectrum and that they're physical? Yeah, I'm saying that uh, a mode, uh, when we compute uh, when a mode crosses the horizon, there is a small correction with respect to when we do the classical calculation. But so, so I, I, I have gained control. the impression that you were very, that you and uh, Matthias were just adamant against such terms. 
you might recall that paper that uh, Wakith and Emily and Emory and I. Uh, this is a, uh, okay, this is a very different effect. Exactly. I mean, as I said, this is not time dependent. It's just exactly that. It's, it's growing with the E foldings and it's down by the loop counting parameter. Yes, but if you check. Uh, it, just, just saying that that just cannot happen and it would be a major. This is disaster. not to be confused, as I said. This is not to be confused with a time dependence on zeta. It is this, zeta, the mode is constant. The amplitude of the mode is constant at the riso. The scale at which is projected is different. It's a complete, this uh, effect comes from modes shorter than the mode under consideration. It's one, a completely different one, effect. Would one way of saying it be that it's just a rewriting of the usual power spectrum in different coordinates, and therefore, since the power spectrum is time independent, writing it in different coordinates can make it time. Like spatial coordinates. I mean, it's, it's, you're just rewriting in different spa spatial coordinates, right? Uh, I think uh, do, right? I'm saying something very. Um, yeah, you can do the. Uh, so if you do, n there is nothing wrong in doing the calculation the coordinates you want. I think I'm using coordinates that makes the, f the, f the effect uh, very simple immediately to get them. Yeah. I don't recall anybody having identified this this effect, but maybe no, no, you do. No, no, just okay. I mean, all you're doing is basically just you know redefining the spatial coordinate and then. Yes, but you see that if you define the special coordinate in a way that uh, you know that the automatically does what will cancel later in the calculation. Yeah, so what I, I'm trying to answer Buddha's question, right? So no, it's a different, okay, I'm going to answer Buddha's question in the second part of the talk, which I will never get. So this is not a, a time dependence of zeta. I, I'd like to hear the answer to Woodard's question. What, what's the no, answer? I'm just trying to say that if the, if the initial power spectrum is time independent, just rewriting it in terms of a different spatially rescaled coordinate won't make it time dependent, right? So the full power spectrum has still to be time independent. Now you can split it into different paths, which have spurious time dependence, but it has to cancel. Those time dependences has to cancel out in the end, right? I mean, because so I mean, you started with something which was time independent, and you, you know, I mean, cannot. You're saying that there's no time dependence in the end? Uh, they, they cannot be, right? Because they're just rewriting the the, the, the initial power spectrum in, in terms of different spatially rescaled coordinates, right? Do you agree with the statement that you're saying that there's no time dependence, or that there's no uh, delta, in, there's no n sub e dependence on so this? So this is just a projection effect. It is not, there is no time dependence. I, okay, I, I didn't listen. So there is no time dependence, okay? There is, th th this is just a projection effect, which is uh, asking yourself where a mode is seen if now. If I made n sub e change, as mm -hmm. I might by having a different Yeah, this will change, but... Uh, so, in other words, if zeta were to be time dependent during the, the zeta epoch, uh, during the, an observer in the zeta space would notice that is accelerating with a different uh, Hubble, pi, Hubble, Hubble rate. This is not happening here. So that's, that's the way to say that. In other words, uh, this is a, in fact, it's a very, very interesting fact. Uh, maybe I'll say, I'll say net, net, next. This is uh, an effect which is enhanced expansion, but not enhanced expansion rate. It is a, it's a, just a global effect. It's a projection effect. I mean, the Earth observer in the city space doesn't notice it. Okay. So that's okay. This I think is the sharp. Thanks for asking because this is the sharp way to see the difference. Okay. Hubble is the same as in the perturbed universe. Could you go back to this? So this came from. So you had an e to the three zeta in the numerate, in the exponent, and then you brought it down and you computed the expectation value. Right? Yes. I mean, could it be that one measures the? I mean. Isn't this effect sensitive to how we define the long distance? I mean, how exactly we average over the short distance fluctuations? I, I for think example, mm. I mean, isn't this uh, an issue similar to what we have with fractals and so on? Yeah, yeah, I think it's similar, but uh, I, I think, I mean, uh, yeah. The, the distance between, uh, I think it is. I think it's exactly the same effect. Uh, but I think here you cut it off at, uh, at the Hubble scale. I think until uh, the Hubble scale, uh, I think uh, the effect is, uh, is fine. Right, uh, what I mean is the volume, so you have something that's yeah. wrinkled, and you are saying just the volume is bigger because it's wrinkled. Yes. But maybe we could define the distance to average this wrinkle salt, and we have a... We I have think a this is, you could define the distance in that way. Uh, but isn't yeah. it trick? I, yeah, uh, some, some, as, as you do in your theory with uh, large scale structure, where you find this average metric, so if you define some kind of average metric, then... <coughs> I think uh, because these are all, uh, um, I think. Uh, um, but, but if all you do is to rewrite the power spectrum in a different spatially rescale coordinate, I mean, then then you and then you tailor expand or something like that. Uh, 
something equivalent on this new protein. And then when you resume that Taylor expansion, shouldn't you get back what you had before? I mean, isn't that, I mean, maybe that's what the same No, thing. I don't think this effect uh, cancels. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not doing the full calculation, so of course you can do it in a different way. We're not talking about that. We're talking about uh, yeah, if there I, is an I overall... Think uh, this is kind of what I think my, this might be is that the fractal dimension of the universe is slightly bigger than 3. Yeah. So, so this should be viewed as 3 plus epsilon. Epsilon is G Newton or something. And it's growing faster because you, when you go to longer distance, you see more and more of these wrinkles. Yes, yeah. it's exactly that effect. But I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant in averaging it out, this effect. Because, uh, first of all, these are all super Hubble fluctuations. I think, uh, um, for example, there is really more matter. So is it, is there is really, like if I ask uh, how much matter is in the region, given that these are all Hubble, there is no equilibration time, nothing. This is really Hubble region. So if I do the integral over the matter, I get uh, 10 to the 20 kilos instead of 10 to the 18 kilos. And, 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 so, and the object I form is big. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite confident about this. And in fact, uh, okay, I mean, right. uh, you see, so because... It's, it's a slightly bigger dimensional volume. I mean, it's yeah. dimensional volume. No, no, it's a small effect, but it will be... It's a small, no, no, I mean, uh, but I, I thought you were wondering if uh, actually it's all the definition could be yeah, made zero. Right, no, right. yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it's a small effect in this regime, but I think it's physical effect, because of the, what I just said, because the super... The thing is that this mode don't fluctuate, uh, they don't oscillate, right, for example, so it's kind of... I don't think you can integrate them out in there. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, okay. So now, this is, a, I said that there is an average overall enhanced expansion, but these are quantum operators, so why I took the average and not the variance? I think there's a nice effect that the enhanced average of the volume is proportional to the number of withholding studio and of inflation, so it can be made arbitrarily large by making inflation last longer and larger. Notice that the variance instead is always over the one. That is, is not enhanced by the number of foldings that should be here. This is because, uh, what is the physical effect that's going on? A mode crosses the horizon and expands. While the modes expand, short modes crosses the horizon. And in each point, uh, the inflator will go up or down, backward or forward. If it were backwards, by the time it reaches the, the starting point, it has produced more volume. So even though the jump backward or forward, forward are the same on average, you get more volume because uh, when you jump backward, you get more, more volume. So when the, the jumps happen, when the mode is very, very long, uh, basically there is no variance because uh, there are so many fluctuations that you get every time the average effect. But, uh, the, when there is, the, but there is uh, it, a, a mode. One Hubble time after the mode has crossed the horizon, there is only or the one Hubble, Hubble patches below my mode. And they have uh, a variance which is of the order of the expectation value of the jump. And so these modes, the first jumps after the mode has crossed the horizon lead to a variance, but it's not enhanced by the number of refolding because quickly the variance goes to zero. So the variance is, uh, is this, which means that uh, this effect, which is quantum, uh, tells, you, tells you that the, the space time uh, is quantum modified, but it's still quite deterministic. In the limit of number of refoldings to infinity, the average uh, is radically changed, but uh, the, the variance node, which means that the, the universe is still quite deterministic at one over number of foldings um, expansion. Yeah, uh, okay, I think I already said this all. The, the expansion rate is the same. So the quantum variance of this effect is very small. Now, in our universe, the, the, this effect is tiny because delta and E, these are all, delta is 10 to minus 9, so we don't have any room. But uh, in Rho let an inflation, where delta is over the one, where delta rho over rho of the Wubi universe is over the one, this effect is very large. And therefore, uh, it is necessary a non-perturbative treatment. If you ask yourself, uh, when uh, a mode crosses the horizon, which scale it ends up at the end of inflation, it is uh, an order one correction, the one is, needs to be computed. Now, for uh, a totally different reason, we had already done this thing. That is, uh, in a series of papers, we had uh, understood how to quantitatively compute study slow rate and inflation. And uh, the effect I just talked about uh, is, uh, that's why I said Linda already kind of knew that, uh, this effect uh, is nothing but slow rate and eternal inflation when the effect is very small. As this fluctuation becomes more and more large, the scale over which a mode is projected can become uh, arbitrarily large and in principle infinite. That's when uh, eternal inflation, slow rate and inflation happens. And, uh, 
in a different reason, for different reasons, we had already computed the, the volume produced by a certain Hubble patch during, in all regimes of the, of the amplitude of the power spectrum. <coughs> and we found this formula where all pi's, everything is, uh, I, I advertise this formula because I think it's the first time the rate and inflation is understood quantitatively with pi, twos, it's not squiggle here. And uh, we found that uh, as a function of this omega, which is basically one over the delta rho over rho of the late time universe, the volume that you get is this. Yeah, and then it's <laughs> Yes, OK, thanks. Yes, OK, yes. Uh, there's no squiggle in this point, thanks. Uh, so the, and uh, we found a, a phase transition. There's a phase transition when this quantity is equal to 1. So if the potential is flat, more flat enough that this quantity is bigger, is less than one, is, uh, then uh, you have a finite probability to create an infinite volume. And you can compute this probability. Uh, and the probability of creating a finite volume, in fact, you can compute it and this, uh, the integral is less than one. There is a finite probability to create infinite volume. But so otherwise, you find uh, for this parameter omega le uh, bigger than one, uh, potential very steep, uh, you find that this effect uh, the, the integral is always one. And so you only produce finite volumes, but the volume is very different from the classical one. In fact, at the onset of, of the phase transition omega call one, the rating volume is e to the six number of folding. So it's uh, incredibly larger than the classical volume. It's a factor of two in the, in the exponent. But uh, surprisingly, this is, uh, even though the average volume is exponentially larger, the variance is still picked. There is no announcement of the variance. So the universe is completely different than what classically would be, but uh, is still deterministic. So I think uh, this is a, uh, okay, now I want to be, as if uh, we were not enough uh, controversial. Uh, I think this is even better than the Bercol evaporation process, <laughs> because uh, this is uh, only one, of, this eternal inflation is one of the two solutions that I know, black hole is the other one, where quantum effects change the asymptotic space time. And in the black hole evaporation, at least in the standard ones, uh, the space time is deterministic because it's a very slow process. Here, the space time is even made stochastic, so it's, it's even better. Okay, so, and, uh, and now we're beginning to understand it quantitatively. So just for emphasis, so this is a huge IR effect. This is sort of the, well, some extension of the IR effects we were talking about to the regime where they really are important. Yes, this is an IR effect that comes from all the modes shorter than the mode we're talking about. So there is no L, but it's the duration of inflation below when I cross the horizon. Okay, so it's, a, it's the other, it's the complementary. Yeah, yeah, these are modes short. So I take a box, I let it go, and since there are fluctuations of the sitter, of the sitter this box uh, keeps expanding forever, or keeps expanding by a lot amount, by a large amount. In particular, I, I try to advertise because maybe this is an audience which is receptive. What you find is that uh, no matter in all these regimes, uh, the volume uh, that you can create when it's finite, when this, the universe is finite, uh, even though the reading surface can be very, very curved, uh, is never bigger than e to the six number of foldings, which you can write in terms of the sitter entropy as the e to the s the sitter over two. Prob probability to get this num large value of this bound is uh, uh, non perturbative small. And somehow this is a super universal bound, holds in num any number of dimension, higher order, in gravity correction, multi fields. It's a bit of a mystery uh, why this uh, is so universal, but uh, I think it's uh, connected. It's a, for sure the fact that this bound is a consistency check of the holographic interpretation of the city space, but uh, that's where I stop. I mean, uh, it would be very strange to have a finite, uh, arbitrary large volume if the sitter has a finite entropy. Because uh, if inflation ended globally, you would see so many patches, arbitrary number of patches, which seems to be uncorrelated. So I think this is a, anyway, this is a, a true fact of the calculation, and uh, it's for the quantum gravity people to interpret it. Okay. But there are some weird theories where we can violate this bound, right? Some ghost inflation or something? Yeah, when they violate the energy condition, where also the, the sitter entropy, exactly. So, eh? Eh? You see? Eh, it smells uh, something, no? Okay. Okay, let me summarize summar the projection effect. Longer wavelength modes, which are longer than the current horizon, have absolute. Th this way of doing the calculation manifestly shows the following things. 
the longer than most than the current horizon has absolute no effects, much longer than my mode, but shorter than the current horizons, a projection and dynamical effects that start at horizon re-entry. So all of these modes have no effect on the reaching surface or up to horizon re-entry. So no worries from the city space. It's not that the theory of the city space is ill-defined. We can just use the astrophysics code to, to do the job. You should probably say again, all of no local effect, right? Because there really yeah, is a, an effect imprinted on people. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should say that. I don't know how to think about no local observables in gravity. So I, yeah, but I see what you mean. But I don't know what to say. We observe things again, which is super horizon during the phase one. Anyway, so I think this is uh, this is the consequence. Well, yeah. Shorter wavelength modes enhance the, the scale over which a certain mode, K mode, is mapped to the, to the late universe. This is a physical effect. It changes the relation between scale and the amplitude of the power spectrum. And it's the child version of slow and inflation, which is now quantitatively understood. So now, this is a, a list of the results. The only thing uh, I've assumed so far, and it took one hour, <laughs> it, it was supposed to take 20 minutes, uh, is... Uh, the fact that it improves, uh, which is why zeta is constant in time. So far, I assume that uh, short modes, which is what Woodard uh, was uh, complaining. So zeta super on super horizon is constant. So I've, so I've, I mentioned that it's proved, but I didn't present the proof. And uh, I didn't know if there was enough time or not. So I just asked, I mean, I think uh, it's one hour. I mean, I didn't imagine. So yeah, let's see what, well, so you're suggesting you it's still uh, for me, it's the same. I have read it, but I'm ready, but I don't want to take the time of uh, important people, so well, it's okay. Just, we can see what people think, right? Or maybe also the, maybe the aficionados. The aficionados can stay. Yeah, let's have a little bit more discussion than we could extend for aficionados. Yeah, it, that could be continued. Yeah. I, I think some discussion is good. Uh, uh, well, let's first thank Leonardo. Maybe a quibble, but I think actually it's more than a quibble. Uh, you know, that is now quantitatively and rigorously understood. You know, really, if we this is an example of where we have sort of an important <coughs> quantum gravity problem to think about. Uh, you know, computing the wave function of the universe and the relevant observables in the eternal regime. Uh, you know, that's something we don't know. I don't think how to. Yeah, sorry. After we no. we have some sto stochastic characteristics of it, uh, which you know may be rigorous, but but you know really what what's the wave function? Uh, no, no, sorry. I mean this is a re refer to this uh, reheating volume yeah. that you see become larger if you take delta one, and this I think is resumed uh, by the, those formulas. Yeah. yeah, right. We don't know everything. I think uh, it's true for eternal inflation. I think uh, it's the first time. Uh, I mean. That paper has two citations, so that's why I keep stressing it. This is the first time a calculation of the roll inflation has been done. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, and uh, maybe some people can contribute because, uh, is, uh, yeah, for 20 years it was all squiggles and jumps. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, there is, there's been progress. Yeah, there. so that's probably, yeah, and there's much more to do for it. So. Mm. Third discussion. Richard. Okay, so I'll bring up this issue again of the paper that I wrote with Mary Kekia and Bakifa Nemli. Um, it was based on a paper that you and uh, uh, Matthias Del Ariaga wrote uh, criticizing Weinberg's uh, paper, and you were uh, stating that it would be a tragedy, I think that was your words, if there were an effect of exactly the type that you're now saying occurs. No. Yeah, the, the, if there are effects at exactly the time that Weinberg was saying that they possibly could have been there. So one way didn't make a strong statement. Why is one a tragedy and the other is not a tragedy? Because this is a, a... They're both very, very small. They're both suppressed by a loop counting parameter that, as you noted, is about 10 to the minus 10. And they can't possibly get any bigger than about <coughs> a factor of 100 due to the number of e-foldings. Why? I never understood that statement at the beginning about why it was a tragedy. Uh, so one way the results... Uh, okay. Uh, Weinberg is great, okay, so. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, he had done a, a few, I mean, he, had, he was the first to try to compute these uh, things in the inflation, so it's fantastic, okay? But he had done some mistakes uh, in the calculation. Matthias and I pointed that out. First of all, uh, he found that the logarithmic divergences are k over mu. 
which uh, this violence gets invariance, and this is a tragedy, okay? So uh, if uh, you take this result uh, as it is, uh, it implies uh, a time dependence of zeta out of the horizon. And this, uh, for example, would mean that, uh, for example, it would mean several things. So, so you can choose uh, how to make a gauge invariance. Either you put uh, A or T here, or you put K H over, over Q. And there were two choices. If you put this, uh, the zeta becomes time dependent, very large. And uh, because the, Why very large? Because uh, log, uh, log is a big number. I mean, could, no, in, pri in principle, sorry. Like no, no, sorry. It was an in principle question. It was an principle problem. That is, uh, the. Um, so just exactly like what you're saying? Uh, no, because this is uh, the fact that uh, the mode uh, shorter than the horizon change the amplitude. Uh, now, can now I? what you're talking about is why it's happening, but no, no, no. You, you were saying that it would be a tragedy. I never understood that because it's suppressed by a, a loop counting parameter that's 10 to the minus 10, and it can't get very big. It's a logarithm of something, and it just, even if the something gets huge, it, the biggest it can get is about 100 or so. So if, uh, yeah, it's true. No, for the current universe, uh, it's not a tragedy, and that's, but if you, you're right. So if uh, you meant uh, from our paper that uh, we, by tragedy we meant in the current universe, is not, there is no tragedy in the current universe. In fact, uh, we can just forget to compute this stuff at all in the current universe. Well, okay, so we're now, in, is in principle, in principle, this is a very problematic, this well, effect. Okay, so we're in agreement. I, I actually agree with you that, that there was that, uh, there were two cases that Weinberg said that there weren't thread logarithms, and you were dead on right in the first one. Dimensional regularization he wasn't implementing correctly, and I, I agreed with you. In fact, I convinced him of that, so, and he very generously uh, credited you all with that. So I think that issue is resolved. The second one I think he was right on. I know that you and I disagree on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd yeah, like you, you will listen to the second part of the talk. Okay, yeah, so it's about the, 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 the proof of the zeta is constant. How about the paper that, that, uh, that the, the calculation that uh, Vakif and, uh, and I and Emory did, we actually got an effect which looks just exactly like the kind that you're talking about. It does uh, no. grow with the number of so, buildings. And, so. and, and further, it comes from modes, that, uh, from modes which are inside the horizon uh, of the one that... Um, has already crossed the horizon, because that's exactly what is producing the infrared logarithm. That is, if you look at VEV of phi squared, the, the growth in VEV of phi squared is not coming from the super horizon ones. It's coming from the, the continual Can I, yes. which are crossing so the horizon. I think, uh, on. Yeah, I think uh, we disagree in the following thing, which uh, we disagree. That is, uh, the, if I do the calculation, this uh, effect was in a different coordinate, where we are using reheating volume instead of moving volume. If I do the calculation, which is what is going to be shown here in the next part, yeah, if you do the calculation in commoving coordinates, we get zero for zeta dot. And your paper in the so same coordinate gives non zero. So that's the difference. Sensitivity that, um, that, uh, Steve and I think, in fact, uh, in commoving coordinates, the, 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 the IR sensitivity is there, will cancel until when you do the when you do the things that you see in the, in the eyes. That's why I don't use well, commoving coordinates. Well, if it all cancel, then why do you have to do anything? to make it manifest that it will cancel. Unless you go and produce and compute uh, uh, the things that you see in your eyes with lensing, uh, it's just that I'm what lazy, so it we try to. In the calculation of the naive zeta zeta correlator, what causes it to cancel? Yeah, the frequent function and, and so on so, that come from lensing uh, or the modes, uh, super horizon mode, if you, do, if you keep <coughs> using moving coordinates when you, when you see the light in your eyes. They will cancel. People have shown that they cancel, so uh, even uh, people have done this calculation for the CMB because uh, it's kind of relevant for the CMB. If you want to compute the frequent function on the CMB. So, because uh, violating that is like Maldacena consistent condition. People have checked that the Maldacena consistent condition check cons works for, for uh, the, the current universe. Anyway, I mean. Other discussion? We've got a fair amount of time to cookies. <laughs> Ah, then I can go more in details. I mean, you know, sorry, yeah. <laughs> let's see. All right, I'll let's go basic. No, she, she was. Let's, no, uh, let's. Let, let's. Oh, yeah, so the, about the prediction of a cluster of the Hubble of Brianda. So that uh, about the so CMB stuff, so the people, uh, the Yaga has discussed about the consistency relation, right? Mm -hmm. I thought that is about the project, projection of after the flight of Brianda. And then I thought the conclusion is that uh, so that effect should be canceled. 
Yes. 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 Yes
this, this variable zeta is constant outside the horizon is because when it's outside the horizon, it's degenerate with the scale factor. And by gauging variance, nobody cares about the scale factor. And so it's very hard to change the scale factor. Well, Why you should... Sure about the time dependence of the scale factor? The time dependence... So the factor... Yes, yeah, so the, if uh, you were... You're claiming zeta doesn't have. So if you study... You put, I'll give a talk about this later. But so <laughs> if uh, uh, it has a dot, uh, it would change the Hubble constant. Homogeneously, locally, you need to change the Hubble constant. To change the Hubble rate, you need to have a change in the, in the Timu nu. And, um, and this is, it just doesn't happen. I mean, uh, to change the, what's the statement again? I, I didn't so this zeta dot uh, is, uh, is related uh, to the, is the change in the Timu nu. In the Timu nu, the, I mean, zeta dot is, over the, is more or less Hubble, OK? And so is uh, having a, a different zeta dot. Why then can't there be changes in Timu nu? Why couldn't something? Because uh, it doesn't have a lot. Changing uh, a zeta dot uh, slowly modulated of very, very super Hubble distances means that there are long, super long wavelength fluctuations, long wavelength correlations. Let's just give you an explicit example. Suppose we call a couple of a, uh, the infoton to uh, uh, a fermion. Right, exactly the same thing that would have destabilized. Yes, uh, yes, yes, sorry, sorry. Well, yeah, good, there. thanks, thanks, okay. With no gauge thing, so the yes. Coleman-Weinberg no, no. points down. Yeah, because, uh, sorry, gains, right? the point, uh, uh, sorry, I should say that this is, but this is, uh, sorry, it's kind of standard, but what this is conserved in single clock inflation. Of course, in multi-feed inflation, is is time dependent even at three level. So you must have one degree of freedom, and inflation is an attractor. So as soon as the mode, uh, Come out of the horizon, you'll find yourself uh, well, always in the same maybe situation. Maybe I wasn't clear. I want to have one infoton, one scalar infoton. I just want to have a, a matter field. Yeah, if you have two field. fields, if you have two fields, if you have two fields, zeta will evolve with time. Can, in principle, can evolve with time. It does oh, so oh, even oh, at the level. Okay, okay. So, so then the theorem that you're quoting that everybody believes that is all that is it's not even relevant to the universe, right? Because we certainly have other fields. I think if the fields uh, are not, don't have relevant, uh, uh, can I, okay, I mean, so I think, uh, really, I think it holds in the true universe if you have single field inflation. <coughs> the important thing, if the fields uh, that have additional fluctuation don't matter for. Uh, uh, okay, then go back to my fermion example. We have a fermion, you call a couple to the, to the uh, infoton, it'll induce a Coleman-Weinberg potential, which for sure is a quantum effect. Yes. Which goes down, not up. Same thing would destabilize the standard model. It's for sure an observable effect. And I think if you define uh, the inflation around the effective potential, zeta is constant. That is, you must define zeta around the effective. As I said, mentioned at the beginning, you must define. It's very important to define zeta as the perturbation around the, the, the right background cosmology. Okay, so suppose that the universe is in some kind of a, starts out in some kind of a false vacuum, and then uh, the um, the, gener the generation of the quantum effects due to the uh, fermion fluctuations is not instantaneous. I can easily create a situation where it's going to be time dependent. Uh, yes, and then we'll see if uh, if it holds with the. I, I what can I tell? I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I need to see a specific example, and then I'll judge on that. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't want people to miss cookies. So let's uh, stop here, but this could continue privately after. And I guess if anyone wants to come back and hear the rest, uh, that could be done after cookies as well. So let's thank me in our audience.